The following podcast contains explicit language. This is Matthew Libatique, ASC, and you are listening to the Cinematography Podcast. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Cinematography Podcast. 33. Holy crap. I did it. You did it. We, we did our thing. We did our, our, our bit that we always our do. Bit. Hey, uh, Ben, you've been looking forward to this episode for a long time. I, not only have I been looking forward to this episode for a long time, but I'm outrageously jealous that you got to interview Maddie Lee Batik. You look jealous right now. I'm filled. Uh, I'm, I'm, I sense daggers flying at me like, I'm through green. the air. I'm yes. literally green. I'm like Kermit the Frog green with envy. I, Maddie Lee Batik is just one of my all time favorites. Well, uh, he does have an incredible filmography. He's nominated for an Oscar this year, his second uh, Academy Award nomination after uh, Black Swan, and this time, of course, for A Star is Born. That's right. And uh, he had a, he had a really good year. He had a couple other movies. He had a little movie, you know, Venom. <laughs> tiny, a, tiny little t- nothing tiny movie. Little, tiny little movie. So, and then, of course, uh, we talk about Everything is Illuminated, which to me, like, he was already doing, he was already just, just killing it, and it came to an even even higher that, level. that was like the movie where he got, he got your attention the cinematography specifically grabbed your oh, attention yeah and it's just it's just gorgeous and uh we get to, we talk about that here in the interview so uh without further ado matthew libatique the cinematography podcast interview maddie libatique thank you so much for coming on the cinematography podcast much appreciated it's nice to be here finally Hey, uh, we are in Camera Homage. We're out in uh, in Poland right now. Uh, how do you like it so far? It's uh, it's a familiar place for me, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, it's just energizing to be here. To be quite honest, I mean, I just ran to Seamus McGarvey outside and uh, Benoit Delhomme on the way out of the airport. So you know, where else can you be when you run into uh, not only um, contemporaries but legends? You know, it, it it's. Uh, almost nowhere. It's it's. I agree. It's really amazing. This is the most special place for a cinematographer there is, and it's the highest honor beyond anything else to be here and screen here. So I'm I'm really excited. Yeah, you're absolutely 100 percent correct. And uh, hey, you're having a pretty good time right now. You got two movies out. You got a uh, Venom and A Star Is Born. And in fact, didn't they both debut on the same day? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I. <laughs> It's funny, people keep talking about that, but it's, you know, it's really just a coincidence. Uh, but it was exciting, you know, um, having two films at the same time and having two films do well at the box office. I'm not a real box office person. I don't pay attention to it because um, all I care about is if uh, people see the film. The money and the number doesn't really uh, mean anything to me because it doesn't actually mean anything to me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but I'm happy for all the people uh, involved that are that it means something to. But um, it was cool because you get, uh, when you make a film, especially these two, they're fairly commercial movies uh, or very commercial movies that uh, you, that's, when, you, when your family starts to text and email you, you know you're reaching a wider audience. So that's pretty fucking cool. Uh, okay, so I, I got a question for you that comes from uh, the usual host of this show who's a big fan. His name's Ben Rock. And Ben has, I'm not exaggerating, like a nine foot poster maybe it's eight foot poster of pie on his uh right on. on his kitchen <laughs> his kitchen wall he he loves that movie and he very specifically wanted me to ask you <clears throat> so i'm going to get this out of the way and you're going to do it first and then we can go get into my questions but he wanted to know how working on independence and you had some very humble beginnings with a lot of uh early movies but uh, you also continue to do some smaller movies even after you started doing bigger stuff. And how does the budget and the limitations inform one, you know, independent film versus studio film and vice versa? What uh, what begets the other? As I've gone on and then bigger budgets and more complicated films, what I've realized is that um, those some of those skills translate to being more efficient on the smaller ones. You know, when I first began, I was like, uh, you know, when you first begin, the movie is thirty thousand dollars, like it was on Pi. It might as well be thirty million dollars because I, you make somebody's paying to make a movie, you know. 
and the excitement is there, the same kind of uh, drive is there that you would have if you're making a $20 million movie. So I look back and I, I do I do remind myself of um, Pi specifically because I have this vivid memory of sitting in the back of a um, cargo van with all my gear, drinking, you know, holding a little cup of coffee and wishing I was somewhere else. And uh, like I'd never forget that. If I'm on the set of Iron Man, I would remind myself that was who I was and that is who I am. And when I'm on the set of Venom, it's the same thing or A Star is Born or, you know, I just have to remind myself. And I like I, I never, ever, ever, ever wanted to forget that uh, that was a core of who I what I loved about cinematography. I mean, I was a when I started, I, I worked with Ed Lockman, who is a. Probably my greatest influence in uh, a legend, my yeah. craft. Yeah, you know he's always had that spirit about him, and I, uh, I sort of patterned the cadence of my career after him because I want to maintain the. Um, there's an energy in independent film that doesn't exist in uh, bigger budget films. That if you lose that, I think I might as well just quit. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, but um, going back to your question, but the soul, what informs yeah, me yeah. is actually the the fact that I could I could see how things are done in an efficient manner with money, and then figure out how we could do it on a smaller budget. So, like as I've gone on, I've actually been better at the smaller movie than I used to be when I was younger mm-hmm. because I just didn't have that frame of reference. Well, you got a, you got a few more miles under your belt now too. So I got that. way too many miles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so God, there, there's there's so many different places to go, and I got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. So I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, you work a lot with Spike Lee. Uh, you've done a lot of you've done a lot of cool stuff with Spike Lee. Inside Man, I thought was fantastic and looked fantastic. Uh, uh, I I don't know. It seems like that's a polarizing movie. I talked to other people, but I I I love that movie. Tell me about um, and I'll use this as a jumping off point so we don't have to to uh, dwell just on, on working with Spike. But you work with a lot of auteurs. You work with headstrong, you know, <clears throat> big personality directors. You know, uh, t- tell me about what it's like getting into the the mind of the director. I mean, Darren Aronofsky, John Favreau, Spike Lee. These are all um, people with really you know distinct visions. How how do you approach that? How do you how do you get into that? Well, I feel very fortunate, first of all, to work with people who are auteur uh, driven um, or auteur. I don't know what the term is, but. That's the term, yeah. But they're, they're, they they have a specific vision. I mean, at the end of the day, we're only as successful as cinematographers by virtue of uh, the vision of a director. If I have an idea, it has to go through that person and uh, has to be championed by that person or has to be, uh, you know, uh, remade with that person. So uh, it's I feel, feel very fortunate, but it... I have to say, it's like it makes it your job easier. If you care about the craft, like ninety nine percent of our cin- uh, cinematographers do, you want to strive to make the you know the most um, impactful visual possible. So when you work with a director that's helping you already because they have a vision, then all of, all of a sudden it's magic, and you can only succeed from there because you know you're dealing with somebody who already has a vision and then all you're doing is adding that uh, that visual articulation to it but like at least you're getting the idea the frame the language of the movie the way the film's going to be shot the way they see it so it's hard you know it's interesting and, and and something that i think young cinematographers have to be conscious of is you know you have to listen so much to a director when you don't you haven't worked with them before listen listen and just like really tune your ears towards what they're saying so that you could actually interpret it the right way. And that uh, will lead to less conflict on the set and frustration, which is always uh, happens anyway. But then, you know, uh, the less frustration that happens with the director, the better. You want to understand what they're trying to do. And then, you know, I always remember uh, what Owen Roysman says in Visions of Light. He says, uh, you know, I'm a cinematographer. I should be able to do whatever you want me to do. And when you look at his career, he's also a very big influence on me. Is uh, you know, you look at the Exorcist in French Connection, and um, you you know, this guy could do anything, you know. And I've always uh, tried to do that myself because it is our job. And um, John 
is completely different than Spike, and Spike is completely different than Darren. And if I if I had uh, my aesthetic imposed everywhere, then you know it, it wouldn't work. You know, I have to kind of work my uh, skill set towards the person I'm working with. I think that you answered that the best way you possibly could, and very diplomatic too to all to all those those people. So, well, they're all different. I mean, I love them all. All oh. three of them. I, I, they're they're fantastic, and they 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 bring out, you know. And in my recent film, uh, Stars Born, I'm working with a, a director Bradley Cooper, who you know you know everybody's like he's a first time director, but he's actually he's not a first time filmmaker. I mean, he's an actor. He's he's been number one in the call sheet how many times. And he's worked with legends like David O. Russell and Clint Eastwood. He he has a vision and he's intelligent. I think um, the only thing that sets one filmmaker apart from the other is uh, uh, is their intellect and their taste, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, they everybody just gets better. And I just had to listen to him. And when you watch the movie, it's my interpretation and his interpretation of the story, but it's also me interpreting what he said and what he's looking for and i you know i like to think that every time i shoot a film it's it's my interpretation or at least the visual interpretation of what the director wants that's a a perfect segue into a question that came in actually via facebook from one of our listeners his name is marcus taplin marcus wanted to find out what it's like uh, or how, how does it change your process working with a director who is also number one on the call sheet. He's the lead. He's the lead in the movie. So I, I know that it just happened with with Bradley Cooper and the Star Is Born. So uh, I'm I'm am guessing your role might change a little, or you might have more responsibility. Or is what 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 how, what what's changing with uh, the director being in front of the camera? Well, you 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 have to be uh, attuned to the performances a little more and help them like I you know you know one of our jobs is to assist the director's vision obviously when we articulate it but it's it goes far and beyond that I mean and in this case I had worked with actors that turned director you know John Favreau uh Leah Schreiber as well and uh Matthew Kasovitz and Spike Lee and you know the list goes on with uh actors that turned director but never really one that was on screen almost you know the entire time and um, it did just took a little extra, and I knew it. You know, it's being aware of the your situation, and then being able to deal with it. So I knew that that would be. I knew it was my first time in this situation going into it, and I literally would ask him, like, "What do you want me to be responsible for beyond what I do?" And you know, he asked me once, "Just let me know if I fall out of my voice." You know, he specifically asked me to listen to his voice when we were watching takes. And, uh, and I would do that. And then I would just uh, naturally look at the performances. And when he'd come, how was that? It wasn't necessarily about camera all the time. It was maybe tone. Because he would uh, emotionally, like, I try to understand. I would try to understand the tone and what a director. I always do this. I always try to understand what the scene is about through the director's eyes. Because if the camera's not uh, actually uh, conveying it, then I bring up the question. Like, well... It, this is about this and maybe we're not getting this or maybe and I, I you know it's not my place to discuss performance because I'm not the director but uh, in this personal case in this specific case I would actually you know say you know she seemed this or she seemed that or you seem this or you seem that just as a note because he wasn't at the monitors and he didn't watch playback rarely did Bradley watch playback so he because he has such an understanding of where the camera is when he's an actor he knows he knows it's in the right place or not which is astounding to me like this is a guy who is acting also evaluating the performance in front of him and he's also peripherally seeing where the camera is so like if he's going to wear multiple hats i could wear multiple hats and uh, that was the spirit of the film uh, 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 across the board for even the sound mixer uh, the sound mixer, myself, the co if costumes, everybody was like wearing multiple hats because we're all trying to protect him, uh, or at least support him, not protect him. But it was a, it was just a, it was a good experience that way. But it, when you work with somebody who's in the film, I think you have to pay special attention to, um, you know, the film on that level, 
and not just the shots. Like, you know, when I normally do a film and I'm operating, or if I'm not operating, I'm watching the visuals and making sure all the beats are handled on my end. But also narratively, but like this was a different level. And this was a different level for me. Like emotionally, it had to be a different level. You mentioned uh, Leave Schreiber and uh, Everything is Illuminated. I love that movie. I, that, that, I love that, that movie, that, too. That's a, that's a fantastic movie. It also, it the the fields of sunflowers, it's like iconic to me. It's like that, that what, every time I think of that movie, that immediately, those shots, <laughs> those shots come back to me. It's, 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 it's really fantastic stuff. Take a, take a minute or two. Tell me a little bit what that process was like. Uh, did you guys travel to, uh, to Russia to shoot that? Did you, where did you guys, was that local? We actually shot that film in Prague, in Prague, uh, oh, okay. uh, in and outside of Prague, mostly outside of Prague. So uh, what was know, the shoot like? Was it a was it a quick indie sort of you know really tight schedule trying to pack a bunch in, or did it have did you have a little bit of breathing room? What was what was that like? You know, in both cases, it's funny that you say that. It's like Liev and Bradley both um, because they're actors and um, they don't have that directorial anxiety of time. <laughs> you know, I think they're aware of it, but uh, you realize that actors don't really uh, feel the anxiety of time you know like i'd like another one even though you're maybe you're you know three hours late and you're probably gonna lose a scene that day i'd like another one. Oh, sure well, yeah, yeah of course you can have another one so i think that they both um which is a refreshing thing because if you alleviate the anxiety of time you can still be creative on the second half of the day and not just the first because you're doing the right thing um, and Liev had that same quality where he was didn't have that anxiety of time. So, but it did have an independent spirit. The film and uh, you know the sunflowers were an interesting thing because um, you know sunflowers respond and they face the sun. And of course, the cinematographer, the wide shot, the big boom up, you know, the crane shot, like the one of very few crane shots that we were able to have because of the budget. Uh, I wanted it to be backlit, so I had scheduled it at a certain time of day. And then I had learned that well, sunflowers only face the sun. So I had to sort of, um, I mean, I didn't know it, you know, I wasn't studying them. I just was told that by, um, I think it was a greensman or something. I ended up having to shoot that at a time of day that I wouldn't normally shoot it because I wanted, you know, the, the light to be uh, backlit. I had to shoot it at a kind of high noon or, you know, I just had to have the sunflowers facing the camera. I'm like, fuck, man. I, I, didn't, I had no idea. And uh, that was an interesting thing. It was like, you know what? Uh, nature rules. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we could cheat uh, all we want for the perfect light, but, you know, nature rules. And uh, it, was a, it was a big learning experience for me. I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to shoot this thing front lit. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's tough to say, hey, uh, son, uh, just uh, over there. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to, you know, got to make it happen. Uh, okay, so um, Ruben Fleischer. I've known Ruben a long time. You just did Venom, Venom with, with Ruben. He's got a... He, a tremendous career. I remember him when he was just starting out making like stop motion music videos. And he was a rental client of mine way back, way back when, but I know you're doing another giant superhero movie right now. You're doing a, you're doing something for the DC universe. Yeah. And Venom, I th I'm sure must've been a, a gigantic, a gigantic budget too, probably even bigger than the Iron Man movies that you've done. So, no, no, oh, really? Was it okay? I had no idea. I just, just it was an assumption. Uh, does the new DC movie? Does that the is it, is it Birds of Prey? Is that what it's called? Birds of Prey. Uh, is is that a an all time budget reacher for you now? I know they, they these superhero movies keep trying to outdo each other. The budgets keep going up. What's uh, it, can you not even talk about the budget? I, I can't probably, really talk about the budget. I don't okay. even know what the budget is. Oh, um, okay. It, to me, it's just it's another it's another film. job. Okay. And, well, it's another film. I mean, I don't. I try not to take a film because it's a job. Really, I, mean, I never really wanted a real job. So, <laughs> um, and hence here I am. But uh, it, it's just uh, you know every film is custom made, and um, that film will be custom made, and it's a completely different. I can tell you this: it's a completely different experience in Venom, and. Um, and it's a completely different experience in Iron Man. And um, who knows if it's going to be better or worse than either one until we go. But, I mean, Venom and Ruben, I mean, that was a, it was an experience. It was like, I, it was a time I, t I wanted to work. I had worked with Ruben on commercials before. And we met on uh, Gangster Squad. And um, I really liked him and his energy and his youthfulness. And when he came to me for Venom, he said the one thing that was magical. He said, I want it to feel like a John Carpenter movie. Mm -hmm. Done. I'm in. Yeah, you yeah. Know? 
and uh i just was i was taken by it uh that concept of like this the, that kind of film like is is missing i think because who knows you know when when john carpenter was making say uh the thing that was a serious undertaking right but as it's gone on in time because technology has superseded some of the things there's a certain aesthetic to it that like uh and I don't want to disparage it at all as a B movie, but there's a certain aesthetic to the thing that I think you can't is charming it. as fuck. Oh no, it's awesome. I think it yeah. holds up really well. It does hold up. It holds up amazing. And um and the tension holds up and it's masterful filmmaking. And I just when Ruben mentioned John Carpenter, I was like completely motivated to make this film. Plus Tom Hardy is an absolute genius, so how could I not be there for that? You know, it was like same as being there for Lady Gaga and watching her sing. It was like watching Tom Hardy being possessed by a symbiote. I mean, come on, man. I mean, to me, I'm like, I can geek out just like anybody else. And I was there. Uh, fantastic. Okay, so uh, I'm going to bring up something here that I don't think most people know about you, but I happen to know because I've been present now uh, a couple of times. Uh, in addition to being a cinematographer, filmmaker, and, you know, man about town, You've also hosted some awards shows. Well, I've only hosted the ASC Awards. That's what I'm talking about, though. You've hosted the ASC Awards, and right. you, did, you did a really great job with that, too. I appreciate so, that. So, uh, what, what, yeah, tell, tell me about hosting the ASC Awards, just because it's like, you know, it's it's sort of an ins, it's an insidery, re, really little thing, but, you know, uh, it's not that little. There's a thousand plus people in that room, and you get to hang out with Angelina Jolie, and you get to go up and present awards and do all this stuff. Tell, tell me about uh, hosting the hosting this, you know, sort of insidery thing amongst all your friends. Like, you know, it started, I, I had to, um, um, years ago, before I hosted the awards, the year before I hosted the awards, it was um, Harrison Ford was getting an award, uh, like a, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And I had just worked with Harrison Ford on uh, Cowboys and Aliens. We really hit it off. And he said, I'll accept the award if Maddie presents it to me. And I was like, I was, I was talking about a high honor. So I, um, I put together a little bit of a... Um, whatever speech or uh, presentation and you know i went up and did it and people seemed to respond to it and you know they asked me the very following year if i would host the thing and i didn't i didn't necessarily want to it wasn't a goal of mine to do that but i i i was like, okay yeah sure and then you know the the, the the fact of the matter is i actually wanted to I, I didn't mind exercising different muscles and the one thing i told myself and i told this to chivo last year because we uh presented best cinematography last year together i said to chivo i said you know what everybody in this room we know we know everybody in this room or they know us so that's what i told myself the first year is that I know everybody in this room, and I'd look, I'd look down at the first row, I'd see Bob Harvey, you know, and I'd look over there, and I'd see uh, Owen Roisman, I'd look over there, you know, I would see people I knew, and it would remind me that this is cool, like, we're okay, I mean, I got past my ASC interview, uh, <laughs> when I got into ASC, I can get past this, that was harder than standing in front of everybody with tuxedos, and uh, I just had, I just tried to have fun with it, and I learned a lot from, you know who I learned a lot from is Downey, hmm. Robert Downey Jr., yeah, it, it's exercising different muscles for sure. Yeah, yeah. And Robert Downey Jr. has this uh, extremely um, poised and relaxed nature to how he, he socializes, and I love it. Like he's just a master of his composure. Yes. His composure is fucking phenomenal. And watching him and having had the pleasure of working with Robert Downey Jr., I just kept thinking about him and John Favreau and how at ease they are around people. So I. Um, I just sort of channeled those two fuckers, you know. <laughs> well, well done. Well, it really showed you. You uh, you pulled it off well because it's like that's a totally different that's a totally different thing getting up. Especially you, uh, some might, people might think it's harder to do it in front of their peers rather than a group of strangers to do that sort of thing. But you know, uh, but but good on you for, uh, for, for, for for taking on. <laughs> well, the now that you said that, so. maybe it'll be harder next oh, time. No. I ever do it again. <laughs> I just got you know to be honest with you, I was like I did it three years in a row, and I was like, fuck, man, I, I want to be nominated for something. I don't want to fucking keep doing this. So I just stopped. You know, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to be the host. You know, I, I was thinking, I was like, uh, I don't know if you remember, you might be too young to know Paul Williams. He, Paul Williams was on like a, a show called The Hollywood Squares. He was oh, a, yeah. like the short guy with long blonde hair yeah. and glasses. I'm like, am I turning into Paul Williams? I <laughs> fuck this. I'm not going to do this anymore. Oh, I remember The Hollywood Squares. <laughs> oh, yes. 
and match game and a bunch of other $64,000 pyramids. Back that wasted youth I had there. Uh, okay. So I, I want to, I want to turn this over to you, man. You, you, uh, what would you like to talk about? I mean, this is your interview. Uh, is there, is there something in anything in particular that you, uh, I'm not saying you have to get it off your chest, but I mean, you probably have one or two, uh, one or two thoughts about things or maybe the direction this, this industry is going, or I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you can take a moment and you know, anything That's you want to talk about, well, uh, this we'll is a talk. huge, I mean, a huge I know, question. I know I give you huge philo- philosophical stuff here, but you can, I mean, I don't actually think about, um, um, the industry necessarily, uh, because I guess, cause I'm in it. I mean, I'm, I'm like most people, I'm just concerned about today you know i'm concerned about uh politically how our world is and i'm concerned about the future i mean i have kids you know i have kids that just started college and i'm like looking at the world and going and I, i'm sure that a lot i'm sure that a lot of parents feel the same way and i just how am i actually helping you know and um I guess it's just about like you know, in these in these forums too you just sort of uh, express your concern about the um, sort of growth of uh, fascism and nationalism. And and as filmmakers, you know, I hope, uh, I really hope that we start making, we continue to make films that entertain, but I also feel like we should um, make films that sort of inform and um, encapsulate the time that we're living in. Because this time will pass, like all times pass, you know, we we need to be conscious of it so uh and socially it's very difficult for me to watch social media where everybody's celebrating themselves over fucking this and that when we're living through a time where it's very critical that we should pay attention and punch into uh what's happening around us so i hate to be a downer but you know that's what i really think about every day right now you know what that's not that's not being a downer that's just being real and (laughs) and i'm I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people won't and i actually think that that is a wonderful place for us to leave uh for us to leave it uh i i have no problem ending on a minor key i think that's kind of like let's do it it's it's much cooler (laughs) yeah it is it's it's totally (laughs) that is the coolest that is the coolest way to do it uh maddie i know you're on the twitters i know you're on the social medias i know you exist out there where can people find you if they want to follow you i mean they can watch your movies and stuff but you're your twitter right you, you, that's what you use. I, I i i'm lately i haven't been on twitter every once in a while i'll, I'll uh, respond to something on twitter but uh i love instagram all right instagram. i love instagram only because it's an image-based uh social media thing and, and where, they can, where can they come out find you on instagram it's at libatique that's it all right maddie thank you so much for being on that's the show. a pleasure I'm, I'm glad i finally was able to be here yeah, me too i appreciate it And now, short ends. So that was Maddie Lee Boutique. Again, for the 50th time, I can't tell you how jealous I am that you got to meet and sit down and talk to Maddie Lee Boutique. It, it was so much fun. And uh, I actually ran into him at the ASC Awards and said, hey, we'd love to have you on the show again. Would you like to come back again? And he said, absolutely, anytime. So next time, Ben, uh, you're up to bat. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just got tingles. That'll be cool. <laughs> He'll be the first person we ever brought back. Yes, assuming we don't get someone to come back sooner than him. So but, We're looking uh, at you, Rodney Charters. Yes, definitely Rodney Charters. All right, so Ilya, it is short end time. It is. What is your short end? It's skateboards. Skateboards? But what does that have to do with cinematography? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. Uh, I was just giving you the softballest setup ever. Go for <laughs> that, it. That's pretty soft. Okay, so two years ago, Kodak and the Girl Skateboard Company collaborated on a product line of skateboard decks and wheels that use the iconography of classic motion picture film stocks. Uh, So like the packaging and it's really only something that's cool to camera geeks. So people are like, I got the 5248 skateboard. That's exactly right. Well, it's actually, there's a 7266 and a 7293. Oh, clearly I was was thinking 16 millimeter and a 35 millimeter world going. Well, uh, well, no, or vice versa actually, but... 52 oh yeah oh, yeah yes yeah. yeah, so, but uh also super 8 so there's a super 8 skateboard deck that's and, my skateboard deck and they look really really cool uh they 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 made an announcement back in 2017 that they were going to do this and of course spike jones a uh, famous filmmaker and also a partner in the girl skateboard company i know he was really instrumental in, in all of this and there's press releases and stuff you can find online but it's now a little bit quaint because you can't find them anywhere anymore nowhere has them and except you, 
That's right. Well, I was getting to that, except, oh, except, okay. but uh, no one has them anymore. And some people just use them as art. Some people actually do ride them, but they've got, they've appreciated in value quite a bit over the years. And the one place that you can find all of the remaining stock in the United States, at least maybe the world is hot rod cameras. We bought all of them. So wow. every single one of these decks, we put five of them up on the wall. We have one more left to, to put up. Do there. you go out in the parking lot and, uh, and shred, do a quick grind, grind, you know, do a 50, 50 and Ollie, do, I, I, do you I, go out there and I, glean the cube. <laughs> I, I do, <laughs> I 80s not, movies references. I do not gleam any cubes. I do not Tony Hawk anything. <laughs> I do not, you know, pro skateboarder or this or that. I don't even Dogtown, and I've spent some time in Dogtown. I don't even know what that means. Yeah, me neither. So <laughs> I, I, I remember the period of my life when I had a skateboard. I was 12 years old, and none of my pants had knees, and none of my knees had skin. That's right. Yeah, and, and skateboards will do that to you. But these skateboards look awesome. They are a combination of... Kodak film stock labels plus uh, girl skateboard iconography and they have different colors on the back side or on the front side so whichever side it is that so there's sort of a customization there's pink ones and green ones and blue ones and black ones and all, all kinds of stuff but we have them all here and uh, yeah if someone wants them they just have to contact us I don't even think they're on our website you have to kind of like know and so you call us and yeah we'll sell you one of the remaining decks oh wow well that's awesome yeah people should do that, that I mean you know we like to log roll here from time to time. I think that's a worthy cause right there. Yeah, it's it, they're under 100 bucks. It's totally worth it. Excellent. I don't skateboard, so I probably won't, but uh, I'll tell all my skateboarding friends to hit you up. It, or, you know, people who just happen to like skateboard art or have skateboards on their walls or who knows, wants to own a piece of history because they're never making these again. They're not coming back. This, this series is over and we've got what's left. All right. All right, Ben. So what's uh, what's your short end this week? So my short end is, as as is often, a crime documentary. <laughs> Lord knows you don't like those. <laughs> it's on uh, it's on Amazon Prime and it's mm-hmm. called Lorena. It is a four part documentary. Oh, I know about that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's been getting some press. Anyone who lived in the 80s, basically. 90s. Know, was it the 90s? Oh, 1995, I think. Oh, crap. OK, it seems like it might as well have been the 80s. But yes, you're right. It would have been the 90s. Yeah, mid 90s. It was a big story. Lorena Bobbitt. Yeah, Lorena Bobbitt. But here's 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 the thing. So it's a four part thing. It was uh, directed by Joshua Rofe. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Mm-hmm. And it is shot by uh, Ronan Killeen, mm-hmm. who has shot like he shot OJ Made in America. And he's, he's shot some some really amazing uh, documentaries. He shot Get Me Roger Stone, which is a documentary that made my liberal blood boil. Literally <laughs> boiled. I got a fever. I had to go to the hospital. Oh, my God. Um, no, uh, amazing, amazing cinematography. But like, I, I sort of feel like we're in a cultural moment where we're kind of going back to the 90s, where I think in the 90s, we thought of ourselves as somewhat, uh, we didn't say woke, but we would have thought we were that way. And then you look at something like uh, Lorena and realize how retrograde uh, our gender politics were. And it kind of, it, it it's a necessary overwriting of the files of, you know, like Lorena Bobbitt became kind of a, a a punchline for a joke you know because she she uh s- sorry everybody uh you know strap in she cut off her husband's penis after he repeatedly raped her yes uh she was horribly horribly abused by her husband and then it was like hey go figure what what you, what kind of revenge could she take upon him yeah and uh I, it kind of re-examines it it has modern interviews with her and john wayne bobbitt the 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 man who's uh weighing she cut off the end of uh, it's, uh, it, it was, I couldn't stop watching it. And I have to say, like, there's a lot of documentaries that I see on, uh, the streaming services that maybe don't need to be that many episodes long. I'm looking at you making a murderer that could, that could have been half as many episodes <laughs> and it would have been great. It's, it's, it's a great television, but after a while it's like, it just kind of becomes core TV for a few episodes mm-hmm. and I didn't need it to be as long as it was. Lorena is four episodes. Wow. And All it's, right. uh, executive, pro- executive produced by, uh, by Jordan Peele, who oh. uh, is using his powers for good. Like, you know, he has the hit with get out and, and now I I'm like, so excited. I'm so excited for Twilight Zone. Twi- I can't. I, Twilight Zone is going to make me get H, uh, a CBS All Access. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's like if almost anyone else had done it, I would have been like, oh, God, they're bringing back Twilight Zone. But Jordan Peele bringing it back. Jordan Peele doing it, it's like, oh, I'm super jazzed for this. I'm, I'm in all the way. And, his, and the trailer for his new movie looks great. But it, it's interesting seeing the kind of stuff that he's getting behind, which I think is uh, I, there's a social consciousness to what he does. And he's able to meld it with something that's very entertaining because the Lorena documentary is also kind of edge of your seat 
uh, really well designed documentary that uh, you know, like it's it's revealing stuff that you didn't know at the time, things that you you hadn't heard. Modern interviews. I will say there's there's one one thing, and I kept bringing it up with my wife, and I don't understand it. One of the Bobbitt's neighbors is interviewed in his car. Everyone Weird. else is interviewed in like regular places, and it's a beautiful shot in the car. And it's like snowing, I think, outside the car, and it looks great. But it's just like I was like, why is no, why is nobody ever done like just a series of interviews about a documentary that has literally nothing to do with cars in people's cars? It's a weird environment to be in because he's just sitting behind the driver's seat, talking to the camera or talking to the to the interviewer in a car. Super weird choice, but um, I, I'm uh, I'm rolling with it. If you get my lame pun. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I thought that overall, like it was, it was a show that, uh, my wife and I just, uh, binged all the way right through. Nice. All right. Well, we're changing up. We've changed up our format now, so we don't have a war story that we're doing. We skipped over that one right here, but we should talk about who's going to, what we're going to do for our next episode and our next episode. Actually, we're going to start diving into all of the amazing interviews and coverage from Sundance. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you got to interview lots of people and I got to kind of uh, breeze in and out of Sundance like a stranger in the night. And I might have a clip of you right now, actually, oh, from no. Sundance. Oh, well, here it goes. Uh, I, I kind of have, have a thought that I, th- I think is important is that Ed and Dan created uh, a situation that was sort of like these actors were in a LARP and they were filming themselves in a LARP and then we were doing whatever we were doing and they didn't know what was happening. So wh- when I talk to people about it, a lot of times I'm like, it actually is a documentary. And like all documentaries, it's omitting one convenient thing. And in this case, it was that they knew it was us messing with them all along. And they're actors, and they're putting performance into it, and they're doing all their real work. But like, it, I think the authenticity from it comes from the fact that it does feel like a real documentary because they made it like you would make a real documentary. All right. So, hey, Ben, it sounds like you had a pretty good time. So that you It was did. awesome. But like I said on a previous episode, I literally was in Sundance for about a day. But I've, you got to self-promote. You got to go out there and show your face. You got to be like, you no, know. No, it was great. I, you know, yeah. You know, reconnect. I, I, I'm uh, one of the lucky few people on earth who kind of got to go stand on the stage of the Egyptian theater and talk about a project that I'd worked on some 20 something years ago. 20 years ago. Amazing. <sighs> <laughs> no, nothing like that to make you feel young. I feel old as fuck. <laughs> All right. So uh, next episode after uh, next episode is going to start diving into Sundance. Sweet. So, Uh, uh, Ilya, who should we thank this week? Let's thank our producer, Alana Cody, without whom none of this would be happening. Let's thank our uh, composer, Kay Zalatracci. Kay, we love you. If somebody email Kay's, go to www.musicbykays.com and say, hey, Kay's, like your music. You don't need and And we heard it on the cinematography podcast. Or don't like your music. Oh, yeah, hate but, your music, <laughs> and I heard it on the Cinematography Podcast. <laughs> Anything to to let Kays know you exist. Hey, um... Also, a shout-out to our fine editor. Yes, our editor, Ben Katz. Uh, and, and Ben, where can people find you? As always, you can find me on Twitter, at Neptune Salad. And, uh, Do you tweet? I, I, I tweet quite often, and, oh. I, and I retweet. Yes, no, uh, tweeting is... Uh, Do you follow back? I, I tend to follow people back, and uh, let me read you my favorite tweet of my own from this week. The CinePod uh, podcast page on Instagram always follows back. Uh, I, I tend to follow back unless someone's weird. Ooh. Um, <laughs> and you're the arbiter of what's weird. As always. Yeah. Um, so, oh, God, I can't find a whole lot. Uh, I, I tweet and retweet a whole, whole lot. That's my problem. So, um, so our son, uh, Madden, uh, we got him this, uh, cell phone looking thing that has like little apps, but they're each just buttons that play music. So this is my hilarious tweet. You ready? Strap in big comedy coming your way. Okay. I'm strapped. We, We got Madden this toy cell phone with apps that play sounds and songs when he presses them. He loves everything about it except the entire U2 album that came pre installed. And there's a picture of my son holding the phone. Isn't that, it's a good, good shout out to, uh, 2014 when everyone who had iTunes had to get a free U2 album they didn't want. I just explained my joke. It's poison. Mm -hmm. It's comedy poison. Yes. And of course, like 75% of people who are not Apple people, maybe 
don't have any knowledge of this. Uh, you know, Twitter Twitter doesn't have to. I'm not trying to be everything to everyone, baby. I, 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 I can handle. I'm it. also going to recommend the Overheard LA Twitter account. That's a good one to follow. Uh, you know, my favorite my favorite uh, novelty uh, Twitter feed is definitely Nihilist Arby's, and I went so far as to buy their T-shirt. <laughs> Nihilist Arby's. Yeah, yeah. Here, I'll I'll read you a Nihilist Arby's tweet. <laughs> okay, well, aren't you going to ask me where where people can find me, or it's yeah, just going to be Nihilist Arby's? We'll, now, we'll get there so. real quick. I, I'll, I'm just going to read the the most current. Nihilist Arby's. In honor of President's Day, just bring your kids to any Arby's and we'll put them in a cage. No questions asked. Enjoy Arby's. Oh, hours, <laughs> hours of horrible Nihilist fun on, on Nihilist Arby's. And again, I, I've never done this before, but I bought the T-shirt from a Twitter feed. Uh, and, and and also uh, one last thing about Twitter: uh, bonus points to anyone who can figure out what my fake uh, novelty Twitter feed is. Um, which uh, ooh a challenge uh, yeah yeah it's a big challenge anyone listening to this I have a fake novelty Twitter feed that is not me mm. and it is also not nihilist Arby's <laughs> and uh, I if you can figure it out uh, you'll just have to look at your retweets right that's, it, it, that's, that's not true because I retweet all kinds of stuff so if you can figure out what it is Ilya will uh, give you a free hot rod cameras t-shirt I don't have any t-shirts. It'll be a hat. Ilya will give you, if you can figure it out, Ilya will give you a free Hot Rod Cameras hat. So, Ilya, where can people find you? They can find me over here at Hot Rod Cameras. and uh, like In the actual building. In the building at Hot Rod Cameras, at least Monday through Friday. That's typically where I'm at. Cool. So. Just come over and just yeah, walk or, up. Or they can they can go to like you know Instagram, at sign Hot Rod Cameras, or Twitter, at Hot Rod Cameras. Uh, you know, any of those at and Hot Rod Cameras. But if they show up here and demand a hat, will you give them a hat? Yeah, at least for at least for a period of time. So, we get a huge run on hats, and we have no hats left. So, I, if podcast I, listeners, if you're in if you're in Burbank, you're in Burbank and, and you want a free hot rod cameras hat, yeah, until let's say the end of March of 2019, show up, ask for Ilya, demand your hat, demand a hat, walk yeah. right out the door. <laughs> you don't have to do anything else. Yeah, but if you, no more sun in your eyes ever again. You, you know what's going to happen though? Johnny Durango is going to come in every day and ask for a hat. I don't blame him. I mean, Johnny Durango, he, he needs a lot of hats. He he's here all the time anyway. But is he? Oh, but yeah, he well relatively frequently so that's cool yeah so now there's a little easter egg we'll find out if johnny durango is actually listening to the end of every show yes yes johnny the <laughs> the gauntlet is thrown <laughs> so thank you very much if you're still listening to us ramble and uh, we'll see you at the next episode of the cinematography podcast this has been the cinematography podcast presented by hot rod cameras find your next camera lens or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.